Fury at Midway. This is a war game whose topic is pretty self-explanatory. We are at Midway. I'm not showing you the cover as I often do at the beginning of my videos because there's a Ziploc bag a game and the cover when uh, flipped face down becomes the turn track and the air operation points track and I already set that up for you to show how the game works. So Fury at Midway, yes we are where the title says we are, two players, one will control Japanese forces, one American forces, we have two boards uh, printed on, on paper and then we have uh, counters and we have a rule book and some cards, although the game is not card driven, as you will see I think it's barely card enhanced. So the game, ideally, as you can imagine when you see the two maps, will be played with two players that are sitting on opposite sides of the table, possibly they have a screen in between, so there's going to be, there are going to be elements of double blind. But maybe, and surprisingly, as I was re reading the rule book, I expected that the surprise would be about the position of enemy forces, which is not exactly that, because you're usually going to know where the carriers of the opponent are. Uh, the secrecy comes to how the defenses, uh, how the aircraft are going to set up, they are patrolling around the, they are patrolling around the, the aircraft, so they're in the hangar, they're on the deck, ready to go, that kind of stuff, really. The position and the commitment of the aircraft around the carriers is what you're supposed to keep secret. Although, then the robot tells us, oh, by the way, the, the game was designed without any hidden element. So actually you could play with a human opponent simply sitting uh, in front of each other and so you see exactly where the aircraft are. So it's a bit unusual uh, but basically the robot tells you play it either way and I played it and I played it both ways. I played it against a human opponent so with double blind with a stack of games in between as a screen and then I also did play it solo so you can play it solo two-handed and there are enough random elements there that ultimately you realize that knowing if this aircraft is here or here, that doesn't really matter all that much. You're gonna roll so many dice that ultimately that is gonna trump a lot of other considerations. Uh, we're talking about the turn track. The game will last at least three turns. Although it's also possible that you just concede after turn one because you know you're gonna lose But at the end of turn three there is gonna be a check If a player has completely destroyed the cares of the opponent the player wins that makes sense If a player has at least three times as many surviving carriers as the opponent also the player wins If neither applies then you're gonna have a night turn which is a little bit of in between fleet move uh, air, aircraft have to go back to to the carriers, that sort of thing, and then you're gonna have three other turns. Uh, that also in this day two is also when the uh, Japanese midway invasion force enter, enters the board and tries to make its way to midway, as possibly American forces are trying to to pummel it, and so. At the end, uh, so if you do play the second game, then you check victory again at the end of the of turn seven. If it goes that far, there will be a mini game in turn seven as the uh, invasion force, Japanese invasion force, reaches midway, and there's a mini game to resolve the fights between the midway garrison and the midway uh, invasion force. And the idea is that during the game, uh, the Japanese will be pummeling midway and the Americans will be pummeling the invasion force, trying to reduce uh, the force of the opponent so they have better chances during the mini game. So again, three or seven turns, or sometimes you give up at the end of turn one, but that's the general idea. If the game goes to the end of, of turn seven, then victory is based on victory points, which are assigned for control of midway and for elimination of enemy carriers. Enemy carriers that are inoperable and just limping around but have not been sunk do not count for victory points. I'm gonna zoom in and show you uh, the Japanese map but again the general idea is the same as the as the American map because they are meant to represent the same space and if you are playing in the double, double blind is not the exact word because again you know a lot of information. The limited information version of course 
you will have markers on both on both uh, what call it? on both boards representing well the position of the main Japanese force, the 1AF, and the main uh, American fleet, the uh, the CSF. So basically, the position of this marker tells you where the Akagi, the Kaga, the the Hiryu, and the Sor you are. And so here you have the, the, these displays giving a sense of well, actually marking the position of the aircraft. Uh, respect uh, to um, to their to their parent to the parent ship, and so when it comes to that, an aircraft can be in the hangar, and there can be up to three uh, aircraft there. Can be on the deck. There are two boxes on the deck, or it can be in cap compa patrol right there. The arrows here indicate basically how they can move from which box to which box. There are return boxes, and that is where you place them after you launch them from the deck. They and so they magically appear here. They go on the map on the operational display doing stuff, and then they can be uh, out there flying for two, uh, for two uh, operations, for two air operations. So. If uh, they go and attack and they're done after attacking, they were out flying only for one operation, they go to return one box. Otherwise, after they launch, then the uh, next time you activate them, they go and do their thing and then they return to return to box. Um, also, as for these counters, again, we have a letter here identifying their uh, the original carriers um, will have the dive bomber designation. Here you have the uh, combat factor. If the combat factor is aligned, that you see here, that is an attack aircraft. If it's not aligned, it is a fighter escort. And here we have the movement. Also, when an aircraft launches, uh, when it launches, regardless of point of movement, it can move only up to two uh, hexes, which sometimes is just enough. Oh, hello, American carriers. And, or if it is still in the air, then that second activation, it can move up to its full printed, printed allowance. So, the turn structure can be a little elaborate. <laughs> if you want to, uh, if you want to pause and take a look, it's this one and then, and then this one. If you want to pause and read, I guess it kind of be hard, it'll look a little small, and yes, there's no player that can show you where you have the turn structure, so you have to keep the rule book handy. And again, there are many cases where I wish there was a player, I need to double check this or that, slightly different modifiers if I'm attacking midway or a carrier, and it's all buried in here in the text. Card draw phase, card draw phase. Uh, these cards uh, have some mighty attacks as you, or other effects. As you can see, some belong to the American player, some to the Japanese player, and some can be used by either. At the beginning of the game, you shuffle together the American cards, and the American player draws some, Japanese cards, the Japanese player draws some, and then you shuffle the remaining ones together. So. Uh, then the, the draw deck is, is shared by the two players. Not many cards are drawn really. At the end of turn starting from one, each uh, A player will draw a card. So in turn two, the American player draws a card. In turn three, the Japanese player draws a card. So you're not going to have a lot of cards. Suppose the American player draws a card which belongs to the opponent then simply that does nothing. So, again, it's weird because you have these cards that may do a lot, because some of these effects may be very powerful, or may do virtually nothing because you don't draw yours, or you draw cards at the beginning of the game, they can only be used like in turn 4 or turn 7, so they're just sitting there and doing not much. But, but again, there's a, there can be some pretty wild uh, random swings here if the card that you that you draw applies to you has an effect you can use and some of those effects can be pretty tough after we draw phase uh, after the draw card draw phase the Japanese must commit uh, and decide and announce if they're gonna attack midway they can attack midway only if they are within five hexes, which is past that red line that you see there. So right now that would not happen. Suppose the Japanese player is there, then they are in range 
uh, to midway and they could decide to attack. So they commit that early in the turn. Then the US uh, player decides uh, uh, they need to plot their movement, they commit to their movement. You can write it down, I like to use these cubes so I don't have to use pen and paper. Using cubes to mark the movement and the fleet to move up to two. You, you start the game with one fleet per player if later in the game one of your of your carriers has two damages on the deck, that makes it pretty inoperable and useless, but still not sunk, maybe you want that to get the heck out of there, so you can generate a damage carrier marker, and the way I do it, I place uh, an aircraft, a destroyed aircraft from that underneath, so that marks which one it is, in this case would be the Hiryu, and then you move it. So. Usually you move only one fleet, later in the game you may be moving two. But again, the phases in which the fleet move or how they do doesn't change, which is first a declaration of possible attack from the Japanese against Midway, the American player plans their movement, then the Japanese player executes their movement, if an attack against Midway was announced it is resolved then, then the American player resolves their movement, and then we get to the heart of the game. That seems like a lot when I explain step by step, but in truth, the, the movement phase is resolved very easily. The heart of the game is, uh, is the air operation phases. And so after movement, we need to determine how many air operation points each player has. And air operation basically is what in other games should be called impulses. Maybe that makes it easier for our gamers to, to get a sense of what we're talking about. There's a procedure depending on the distance, uh, relative distance of the fleets and midway. Basically the closer you are, the more information you, ha you have, and so the more air operation points you will receive. And so we mark there how many air operation points we have. Suppose that this is the situation. Then we roll to determine who gets to use the next uh, air operation point. So who gets to use the, uh, to take the next impulse. Pretty simple. The players roll a die, they add the present number of air operation points that they have, highest result wins. And for example, if this is the result, uh, then the Japanese are gonna take the next impulse because they have seven versus five, so they spend that air operation. And, and that's it, they will do their thing. That means that players may be able to take multiple impulses in a turn. When spending an air operation point, when conducting an air operation, simply put, all aircraft can move once. If they are in these boxes here, they move to one of the boxes connected by arrows. So if they are there, then for that impulse, boop, it does that. If it was there, it would go there instead. Uh, you can move them between the hangar and the and the deck. If they're already on the deck, you can launch them. Again, uh, only fighters can be on combat patrol, and you can like, switch them and move them around. So that's the general idea. You're gonna decide what to do there. Uh, just know that having uh, having attack planes sitting on your deck is pretty dangerous because if you get attack, the opponent gets a bonus. And, of course, that's what you're ultimately trying to do, which is to create attack groups, to create attack groups and send them against the opponent. And you probably will want the attack groups to be a mix of attack and escorts. And suppose that the American player is launching that group from the deck of the Enterprise. Do, 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 do. So from the deck of the Enterprise and we're going there, we're attacking there. So here we got two divisions. There's a procedure to see if you get to actually attack the division that you want that will determine which cap group you have to to fight. So right now the American player is attacking and let's say when all is said and done they're attacking the second carrier division with the Soryu and the Hiryu. First 
the cap gets to defend. The uh, defender gets to choose how many steps they want to commit and say they decide to commit these two. These units are two steps each, so that would be four. Each step rolls a die and scores a hit against the incoming attacker for each result which is equal to or lower than the combat value. So three or less. And suppose it's a hit, uh, a single hit, which the American player allocates on the fighter. Then the incoming fighters get to fire back using the same procedure. Then the cap of steps that were used are removed from cap. And that's why uh, it's kind of interesting that way that you may have multiple waves and the defender doesn't know exactly what has to decide how much cap to commit to that wave, not knowing if other waves are coming right away. But basically, once they are used for uh, fighting from the combat, um, from the air combat patrol, uh, then they need to uh, go back to the ship. And then they can be brought back up there. But for the time being, they're taking a break. After that, after the fight between the fighters uh, and the combat air patrol, we got the anti-aircraft defenses so you simply roll two dice for the anti-aircraft defenses each one is a hit on the coming attacker after all that is said and done if there are still attackers that can attack one of the ships they get to choose which one and they roll again a die for each step that they have inflicting a hit for each result equal to a lower than the combat strength if there are if you have a diver and there are attack planes on the deck of the opponent, then your combat strength is increased by one. There are the modifiers if you're attacking midway, but the idea remains the same. Damage. If you do manage to damage the deck of the opponent, then, well, it's if it's only one damage, you roll randomly to determine which of the two sections the deck takes it. If it's two damage, they both take it and now airplanes cannot depart from there anymore because there's no deck to use anymore. If a ship has two damages on their deck and they take a third one, that is when they're sunk instead. It's entirely possible a big killer of aircraft is indeed not just air combat, but the fact that they have nowhere to land after uh, some of their ships have been sunk. This is the general idea. I know it sounds pretty fiddly, it sounds like a lot, and, and, and maybe it is, and maybe it is. But the idea remains that first, there is a fairly complicated procedure on how of how the fleet move. Then you determine air operation points each time, and then you and then you determine who goes next. Each time you take you spend an air operation, all the aircraft can move once. Again, moving around the uh, the carrier or launching, or they're in the air moving. After they strike, they go back to the return box, and that's the general idea. Continue like this until well, the end of the game, and that is when you determine who wins and who loses. Fury Midway turned out to be a little bit of a mixed bag. Uh, it starts with the production. Uh, the, the, the game has, the production has some undercooked uh, elements. It feels like it could have been developed more. Uh, some of the language is not fully consistent. The rule book talks about uh, the Japanese squadrons and the map talks about the divisions. I assume they're the same thing. Um, Sometimes you read a rule that seems to make sense, then when you play the game, you realize that there are some areas of ambiguity there that, that you wish were a little tight, more, a little tighter. Uh, the boxes for the hangar, for the, for the ships, they're not big enough that you can put aircraft there and also see the name. And so you just have to go and check, what, this is the your town, is this the here you, so you... Um, just little teeny tiny things like that, that, well, you wouldn't notice if the, the development went a little further. As I started playing against my human opponent, going past those little details there, the game seemed really exciting. Exciting! I really enjoyed the idea of going in, not exactly blind, because I know exactly where everybody is. After the Japanese player moves, they tell the opponent where they are. After the American player moves, they tell them. They have to plot in advance and commit to that, but then you still tell the opponent where they are. But really, going in and not knowing exactly uh, how many defenses are there, how many are going to be committed, which of the enemy ships 
uh, may make a better target because they have some some uh, fighting, uh, so some attack aircraft sitting there on deck and that makes the whole thing a lot more attractive. Uh, so that was uh, pretty cool, that was pretty cool. Until a couple of, of die rolls uh, had very dire, very brutal results. And that is ultimately the idea. Now, I know it befits the theme, and even thematic, I was like, well, that really works. You have these amazing machines of war that took so long uh, to build, that takes so much effort and coordination and science and discipline to bring them in the middle of the ocean, and then they just blow up. They are just incredible machines of destruction that are so brittle. Thematically, it works. As a competitive game that you play against an opponent and, and you're playing a circle war game, so you want something that's a good war game and you want the history. So the history works, but then you set up the game, you teach them the game, and a couple of die rolls uh, while your fleet is almost annihilated. Um, it fits the theme, but it doesn't make for a game that is particularly compelling in, in that sense. And so, I then I also played the game solo, I played the game two-handed, and I think that it works better that way to me. Uh, because, uh, just because of the, of the massive random element. Uh, then it becomes a solo study, then I want to see the history, I want to try some what-ifs, what would happen if the Americans are trying to intercept the Japanese uh, far from Midway? Probably a bad idea. What if they say next to Midway? Better idea. Also because, again, in a competitive sense, there, are, there aren't many things that, many big things that can happen in terms of the choices, it's about where you position your fleet, and yeah, sure, then you're, you're sending out those waves, and that's fine, but ultimately, the short of it is if the Japanese early on can just concentrate on attacking the American carriers without worrying about Midway, they cast the carriers away from Midway, it's bad for the Americans. If the Americans can combine the forces of Midway and the carriers against the Japanese, it's bad for the Japanese. There aren't many other options there. And so once you set up that situation and then you have a couple of die rolls in which you roll low and you destroy, you completely annihilate a carrier early on, uh, also therefore crippling the, that side's ability to strike later, uh, it's almost it's almost game over. So it is a game that's gonna have some major swings of luck, major swings of randomness. I don't think it's a game they should play competitively. Uh, even if you're playing against a human opponent, it should be about in the spirit of discovering of playing a game, having an experience uh, about this historical event. Uh, because again, then I'm afraid that the meta is gonna take too much. Uh, too much of a spotlight because you can really just count exactly if this hexia is exactly there then i am outside of the range of that thing i mean that thing i can get that number of air operation points and i know that is the case you start just gaming it and it becomes a chess or checkers on a board and then i can just play check uh chess or checkers they have a, a more intuitive, a more intuitive turn structure. Um, and again, going back to the production thing, the fact that there isn't a player aid when you have so many little rules and modifiers, when you have um, a fairly elaborate turn structure, is just just a missed opportunity. But ultimately, when it comes to gameplay, this is the idea. Uh, huge luck swings and they can just brutally annihilate you in a couple of die rolls. A card, again, cards may do absolutely nothing because you don't draw the cards that you need or your cards do not apply to that situation. Or again, a card at the right time may give you the game. It has the kind of luck that I don't usually enjoy too much in war games, which is when you have a limited number of random generators, each having a huge weight. Because again, yeah, you do, will roll dice a lot, but ultimately those dice that determine whether the attack hits the carrier or not, that's that's it, that's, that's what does it. Even the, 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 the cap, 
if you're going in with some attackers and some fighters, the cannon needs to be massive for the cap to really do anything because of course the attacker will take all the hits on their fighters and because the stakes are so high because the reward of sinking an enemy carrier is so huge and so either the cap is immense or ultimately the cap in most cases does not seem to me to reduce the chances of an attack of sinking uh, the ship and that means you're rolling that die and if you roll one to three you're gonna have a huge advantage and if you roll four to five it's a miss. So, huge luck swings, which again, I did not mind at all as I was playing the game by myself, two-handed, as a solitaire study, as a solitaire experience for somebody who enjoys history and who enjoys playing games about history. So, the production is very uneven and is not as professional as I like it to be. As for gameplay itself, mind you, I, I enjoyed all seeing the loops of actions. They go out, then they have to return, and I budget and I budget uh, the movements. I try not to create traffic, uh, traffic jams on the carriers, who is on the deck, who is out there. That part is fun, but then sometimes it feels a bit irrelevant when you realize that just one die roll may just destroy all of that thing. So there is a lot of luck in here, and I, this is a game that I'm going to recommend strictly, not for players, but for people who want to see versions of variants of history come alive. It's a game that is a lot more about the narrative, the gameplay, again, because the story is interesting and fun, but can go in completely crazy different ways, directions, not because of your strategy, but because, again, of luck, luck and some more luck.